March 16, 1865. The Civil War raged on in its fourth year, with more than 600,000 souls lost. Think about that. Even to this day, it remains the deadliest war in American history. A small fraction of the Confederate conspirators are planning to abduct President Abraham Lincoln and take him to Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, holding him for ransom for the release of the rebel soldiers. However, the plan falls through. Shortly thereafter, Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse, beginning the end of the Civil War at last. Angry at losing to the Union, this network of Confederate conspirators decide instead to assassinate President Lincoln. Most people believe that John Wilkes Booth was the mastermind behind it all. He may have pulled the trigger that ended our 16th president's life, but in truth, the plots to abduct and kill were masterminded by the members of the gang of Confederate sympathizers. Booth was a part of this gang, along with many others, including John Surratt Jr., Booth's right-hand man. His home provided a safe and private site for the gang to meet and conspire against Lincoln and the current government. Surratt's mother, Mary Surratt, is a widow and Southern sympathizer. She owns and operates a boarding house in Washington, D.C., where she and her three children, John, Anna, and Isaac, all live. Being in charge of a boarding house means knowing who comes and goes, who meets with whom, and what is being said within her walls. Her finger is on the pulse of activity in her home. How could she not know things? Mary Surratt was a middle-class widow who owned and operated a boarding house in Washington, D.C. She was convicted of knowing what Booth was planning and keeping it a secret. The reason she did this is because she wanted to protect her son, John Jr. On the day, April 30th, Mary Surratt was arrested and sent to the old Capitol building. Executing a woman was unheard of. No woman had ever been executed before, and many were not about to change that. Mary Surratt's trial was very different from a normal trial. The government decided to hold a military trial that has no jury instead of a civil trial. The military tribunals acted illegally in trying people and that the court was full of benedictive groups of army officers who were looking for victims. Though many others were taken into custody, Mary Surratt was given a lot more attention from the media and the public because of her being an old lady. Frederick Aiken was Mary Surratt's attorney. He and Anna fought very hard to save Mary and convince a panel of judges that she was innocent. It was a long process. Some of the judges that found her innocent, while others found her guilty. The judges decided on her verdict. She was found guilty and to be executed on July 7, 1865. Many people found this preposterous and didn't believe that they would go through with this. Even five judges out of the nine that found her guilty created a petition to give her a life in prison instead of execution. President Andrew Johnson claimed he never saw this petition and ignored all the hate from the public and the media. She was 42 and considered to be an old lady. They wouldn't execute her, would they? July 7th, 1865. It was a hot and bright day. Normal weather for late summer in the South. But today wasn't like any other day. Anna Surratt and many others raced to the White House to object to this nonsense of executing a woman. There was no use. The judge's and president's mind was made up. Mary was preparing to walk to the gallows when Lewis Powell had confessed that Mary Surratt was innocent after meeting with Anna and other Surratt supporters. Many people believed they wouldn't kill her and it was just a ruse to lure John Surratt back from Canada. Around one o'clock in the afternoon, Mary Surratt walked to the gallows. Whether she was mentally prepared or unprepared to face her fate remains unknown. After all, she was a devout Catholic and had not been afforded the chance to speak or testify in her own defense. She was dressed in all black and wearing a hat and veil to cover her face. She was accompanied by three men, also guilty. They walk in a straight line with her in the lead. 
They had black umbrellas above them to absorb the heat from the overpowering sun. She was assigned the noose on the far right. That position was considered to be a more honorable spot to die. As she walked up the steps, people were still wondering if she was guilty or not. Her priest was beside her, hiding the noose from her because she had wished not to see it. The hangman tied her hands and legs together, though tying her legs together was harder, considering she was wearing a dress. He also took her hat off to put the hood on. The hat that covered her face, and it was off making this entire situation feel even more uncomfortable for the anxious onlookers. For the very first time in our nation's history, the judicial branch of the U.S. government has condoned the execution of a woman. A hood made out of canvas cloth shrouded her head right after a bristly noose was placed around her neck. Before stepping onto the trap door that would open, sending her to her death, she said, I wish to say to the people, that I'm innocent. She died seconds after. They had executed a woman, sanding a new standard, making it easier the next time. Moreover, the government had executed a citizen for being a suspected conspirator, not a murderer, not an assassin, not an accomplice, nor an aggressor. For being suspected, she had died. Twenty minutes later, the bodies of the executed were cut down and buried into the graves that had been dug. Ironically, only days before, people called her evil and malicious for plotting against Lincoln. After the hanging, however, they were weeping at her grave and saying she was the victim and only a woman. Many people came to her grave in order to pay respect, including Anna, her daughter. John Surratt Jr. fled to Canada after Lincoln died. He stayed there through Mary's trial and was convinced they would not kill his mother. After hearing the news of his mother's death, John took a boat to England. His plan worked until a friend recognized him and called the authorities. He was arrested and sent to Velletri Prison, but escaped and traveled to Italy, posing as a Canadian citizen. He set off to Alexandria, Egypt where he was arrested by the United States government on November 23rd, 1866, and sent back to America. They immediately started a civil trial. He told the jury he knew about the adoption plan, but nothing about the assassination of our President Lincoln. John Surratt Jr.'s verdict in trial was much different than his mother's. On August 10th, 1867, Surratt's verdict was announced as a hung jury, after two months of arguments. The responses from the public ranged from hatred to relief. It would take even longer for the jury to decide on whether he was guilty or innocent. To the add to the complexity of this, his mother was tried and hung because of her letting John, Booth, and their fellow conspirators meet in her house. Later, it was announced that John Surratt Jr. was innocent. In Mary Surratt's life, there are many conflicts. One being her, the first woman, to be executed on U.S. grounds. Another, that Booth and his gang met in her house. Lastly, the conflict between the judges on whether Mary was innocent or guilty. That was the most important conflict in her story. It decided whether she lived or she died. The compromise is the decision between the judges that decided she was guilty. Mary Surratt, is she guilty or merely a victim? The answer still remains in the gray between the black and the white.